Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Carmichael, and I really appreciate you joining the conversation about college financial aid. We're going to get started so we can stay on track. First of all, it's important to understand the total cost of attendance for college. As you're doing your searches for your priority colleges, make sure that you know not only what their tuition is, but please consider your equipment, books, and supplies, personal expenses, room and board, and also, in addition to tuition, your fees. You might see these as in, a in the form of athletic fees, library fees, parking fees, um, but make sure that you understand the total cost. The good news is that financial aid is available from the U.S. Department of Education, the state of Louisiana, your college or career school, and nonprofit and private organizations like Galila. There are three types of federal student aid, free money, borrowed money, and earned money. You can see in this chart that all of these programs are available through federal student aid. The federal Pell Grant, which most of us have heard of, and you can see the maximum award, and that's for this 23-24 academic year. It might change a little bit for the 24-25 academic year. Then there's the FSEOG, which is a need-based um, program for the neediest of students and parents. There's a TEACH grant for those who choose to teach after they graduate. The Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, then the earned money would be considered federal work study. Lastly would be your student loans. You could be offered direct subsidized, unsubsidized, or plus loans to help pay the total cost of your education. Now, federal work study is a great program that's administered by the U.S. Department of Education this provides jobs on all campuses for students who want to work and earn toward paying for their college expenses. If you go to a four-year college and you accept a position, say in the chancellor's office for those four years, that is four years of work study to put on your first professional resume. So please select yes on the FAFSA that you're interested in federal work study. It doesn't obligate you to accept a position, but it does let the financial aid office know that you're interested in being considered. It's important to understand the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized loans. You might see these on your financial aid offer from your colleges. With direct subsidized loans, you your interest will be waived while you're in school. These are need-based loans and those with um, financial need may be offered subsidized loans. There are also unsubsidized loans, which means the interest is accruing even while you're in college. Everyone is eligible for this type of federal student loan. But to remember this, the U in unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest on that portion of your loans. So when you get your financial aid offer, always accept the subsidized loan portion first. These monies can be used at four-year public and private universities and colleges, community colleges, career and technical schools for part-time part or for online college courses. And to access these dollars, you must first complete the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA. Now you're the class um, of 2024. Your first college academic year is going to be 24-25. 
So you need to be completing the 2425 FAFSA when it drops in December. We haven't been given an exact date, but your counselor will keep you up to date on when that form is going to open. Make sure that you are meeting your FAFSA deadlines because most colleges have a priority financial aid deadline. That means the sooner you do your FAFSA, the sooner you are in line to receive your financial aid offer. If you're using the FAFSA as your TOPS application, there's also a deadline for that as well. And you can find out more about that on the TOPS website. And of course, the federal deadline. You have the entire academic year to complete your FAFSA, but unless you're coming out of pocket that first day of school, you wanna make sure that your FAFSA is completed long before that time. Who can complete a FAFSA? U.S. citizens or nationals, those with a green card or an arrival departure record, those with battered immigrant status or a T visa. If you're uncertain about this, you're always welcome to contact me individually and I'm happy to help you. Um, I'm going to leave my contact information for you at the end of the session, so make sure you have your pen and paper ready. First of all, you want to gather all of the documents that you're going to need to complete the FAFSA. Those documents include the student and parents, most recent social security cards, the student and parents, 2022 IRS income tax returns, if you filed one, W-2s from your employers from 2022 should be collected, and then balances of your checking, savings accounts, any investment accounts you might have. Um, the balances of these accounts will be asked to be reported as of the date you submit your FAFSA. So we know the FAFSA is running a bit late. It usually opens October 1, but there are quite a few changes this year. So the start date has been moved to December, but you and your parents can create your federal student aid ID right now. Now this is your electronic signature that will be used to log into the FAFSA, enter your demographic and financial information, and to sign the FAFSA. You must be sure that you're using your most recent social security number and name on that card um, as you create your account. You will wanna make sure you have your mobile phone with you and that you have, your, you have access to your email account. And we're gonna quickly watch um, a video from Federal Student Aid on how to create your FSA ID. Perhaps you're a student, parent, or a loan borrower who needs to apply for financial aid. Please sign your FAFSA form or access other benefits on studentaid.gov. To take full advantage of all our resources and log into studentaid.gov, you'll have to first create an FSA ID. Your FSA ID gives you access to Federal Student Aid's platform and can serve as your legal signature. Your FSA ID is your account username and password. To prepare to create your FSA ID, have your social security number, mobile phone, and or your personal email address handy. To start, Navigate to studentaid.gov and select Create Account. Once you're on the Create Account page, select the Get Started button. If you are completing a FAFSA form and are considered a dependent student, keep in mind that you will need to create your own separate FSA ID using your own personal information. A mobile phone number, email address, and social security number can be associated with only one FSA ID. For helpful tips throughout the FSA ID creation process, 
select the question mark icons that display next to each field. Next, you'll create your username, enter an email address, and create your password. We recommend not using your school-based email address since you will need to access your federal student aid account after you graduate. Make sure you don't include private information such as your name or date of birth as part of your password. Quick tip, remember, an email address can be associated with only one username and password. Next, enter your permanent address and mobile phone number. Indicate if you want to use your mobile phone for account access. We highly recommend this option as it allows you to use your mobile for two-step verification and will help you access your account if you forget your username or password in the future. After selecting continue, you'll be prompted to choose your communications preferences. On the communications preferences screen, select if you'd like to receive required communications from us via email or by postal mail. We recommend email. Besides the required communications, we'll occasionally send you informational communications about grants, student loan forgiveness, or income-based repayment plans you may qualify for. You can opt to receive these by email, text message, or both, or choose not to receive informational communications. You'll also have the option to select English or Spanish as your preferred language for the communications we send you. Next, you'll select four challenge questions and answers. Memorize or keep these answers in a safe place in case you need them to help access your account in the future. Choose a question using the dropdown and add your answer in the text box. Select Show Answer to see your answer as you type it. Your answers are not case sensitive. You're almost there. On this step, you can review your information and confirm everything looks correct. If you need to make a correction, select the Edit button within that tile of information. After ensuring your information is correct, review and agree to the terms and conditions at the bottom of the screen. Now you'll add two-step verification to safeguard your account. Whenever you sign in, we'll send a secure code to make sure it's really you. You can choose whether you prefer email, text message, or an authenticator app. We'll begin with your phone number. Select the Verify button under SMS Verification. You will automatically be sent a six-digit secure code. At the same time, a pop-up window will open. Enter the code and select the Continue button. You'll see a green verified icon appear that tells you you're successful. Next, verify your email address. Select the Verify button. You will automatically be sent a six-digit secure code. At the same time, a pop-up window will open. Enter the code and select the Continue button. You'll see the same verified icon, confirming that you verified your email. You'll also see a green box confirming that your two-step verification is ready to go. We also suggest setting up an authenticator app, which provides the most security of the two-step verification methods. Select Set up an authenticator app. A pop-up window will open. Follow the steps you see there. First, download an authenticator app from the mobile app store or use one you've already downloaded. Next, you can either scan the QR code with your authenticator app or copy the key into your Authenticator app. Then select Continue. Another pop-up window will appear. Enter the secure code generated by your Authenticator app and select the Finish button. You've done it. Two-step verification is enabled. But what if you're in a situation where you can't use the other two-step verification methods? Don't lose heart. You can use a backup code. Your backup code is generated automatically when you enable two-step verification. Store your code in a safe place until you need it. Congratulations, you've successfully created your FSA ID. If you've entered an email address, you will receive a confirmation email. Make sure you note your username and password and keep them in a safe place. You can begin using your account immediately, but it will take one to three days for your information to be verified by the Social Security Administration. Some of your actions in the site will be limited until your information is verified. However, with your newly created FSA ID, you can immediately complete and sign a first-time FAFSA form. 
You can also use your FSA ID to access your dashboard, review your loan balance, and explore additional dashboard features. You are now able to take control of your federal student aid journey and access all studentaid.gov has to offer. So, as I mentioned, you can begin to create your federal student aid ID right now. And the importance of doing this early is that it must be verified by the Social Security Administration before you can use it to start your FAFSA. This is the form that we use when we're working with students. You'll want to make sure that you are recording your username and password that you create and then recording your backup code. There's a lot of information contained here that I'm happy to share with you. If you would like to contact me, email me directly and I'll send this over to you. Now, when you log into the FAFSA on well, not December 1st, we're not sure what date in December, but in December, when you log into the FAFSA website, this is what your homepage will look like. Students who are attending college this academic year are still creating their 23 and 24 FAFSAs, but you all want to start the 24-25 FAFSA. You will log in to the FAFSA using the username and password that you created and identify your role. Are you the student who wants to complete the student section or are you the parent who wants to log in and provide your information? Once you identify yourself, you will be shown what is entered and recorded in your federal student aid ID. So check over this section. If you need to make changes or corrections, you can do so on this page. You will automatically be asked to provide your consent to allow the IRS to transfer your income information from 2022 into the FAFSA itself. This used to be optional, but from this point forward, you will have to provide consent. This is whether you filed a return or not in 2022. Those who do not want to provide their consent do not have to, but those students will not be eligible for any federal student aid. You can see that there are five sections that need to be completed. In the student section, you have the personal circumstances, then you move over into student demographics, then financials. Then the student will enter the colleges that he wants his FAFSA data sent to. And then it's time to sign the FAFSA. You'll be asked questions like this one. Which classification will you be during the 24-25 academic year? Although many of you have already, create, have already taken AP courses, or clipped out of college courses, you still will want to identify yourself as a first year freshman because this is for financial aid purposes. If you have not received financial aid in the past, you will want to identify yourself as a first year student. Then you'll move over into the demographic section where you will be asked to consider a list of questions to determine whether you're independent or dependent for FAFSA purposes. So although you're thinking, well, we'll all be 18 by then, that is not the um, one of the qualifications for being an independent student for financial aid. You will, however, be asked to consider these statements. The student is currently serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces or is a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. The student has children or others who live with him and will receive more than half of their financial support from them now in between July 2024 and June 30th, 2025. At any time since the student turned 13, 
was he an orphan or a ward of the court or in foster care? Is the student an emancipated minor? And then the last one is the student in legal guardianship with someone other than their parent or step parent as determined by a court in the state of Louisiana. And you might not be um, up to date on some of these legal terms. And if you have questions about these statements, there's a question mark beside each where you can get more detail. You will be asked through a series of questions to identify the parent or parents that will contribute to your FAFSA. Basically, your parent is your legal, which is your biological or adoptive parent or step parent. So if you live with both of your legal parents, that's easy. You will just answer yes. Your parents are married to each other. And in that case, both parents will contribute to your FAFSA. However, if you are in a different situation, perhaps you, you, um, your parents are divorced or were never married, then it will guide you through the process of selecting the parent that needs to contribute to the student's FAFSA. You can see here that once those parents or that parent has been determined, the student will be asked to provide the parent's legal first name and last name and other identifying information, specifically their email addresses, because a notification will be sent to those parents telling them that they will have been asked to contribute to the student's FAFSA. The student will be asked some personal information about their gender. Some of these questions, a student can choose not to answer if he chooses not to, and that's fine. You can opt out. And then you'll continue through the student demographic section. Next, you'll move into the financial section. And although your income information from 2022 is already pulled down into your FAFSA, there still are a couple of questions that will be asked of you. You will be asked to identify the colleges that you're planning to apply to because federal student aid is not just going to send out your personal information to all the colleges across the country. You have to give them permission to do that. You can add up to 20 colleges each time you submit a FAFSA. And if you're planning to apply to more than 20 colleges, there are instructions in that section on how to do so. If you want to speak to me um, independently, I'm happy to help you through that as well. Then you want to take a look at your FAFSA summary. These are all of the sections that you've already completed, and it's best to review everything before you sign. So use these drop down arrows to um, take a look at all each question that you were asked within the FAFSA and check your answer to it. If you need to make a correction, now is the time. There's a hyperlink under each question and you just click the hyperlink. It takes you right back into the form to change your answer or to take another look at it. You'll see who the contributors are again, that, that their invitations have been sent. But remember that it takes 45 days before the FAFSA is deleted for your contributors to complete. So let me repeat that in a different way. Once the student begins the FAFSA, he has 45 days to um, convince his contributors to add their information so that he can sign and submit the FAFSA. If it's past the 45 day period, then the student will have to begin again from the first question. The student must agree that the information that he's provided within the FAFSA is accurate to the best of his ability, and then he will sign the FAFSA. Now, once he signs, an email is going to be sent over to his contributors, and this is a general idea of what they will receive. They'll be told why they're asking to complete this, 
what the student will be eligible for if he contributes, and gives him some more general information about what's going to happen next. The parent or contributor will then log into the FAFSA. He will provide his, he will of course log in with his username and password or his FSA ID and almost immediately be asked to consent for the IRS to transfer the, that contributor's information into the FAFSA. Demographic information will be asked about the parent, their marital status, if they have any other students in college, on the size of their household. They'll ask about their finances. Most all of the financial income information will be transferred in, so you won't have to manually en enter that. However, you will be asked to answer questions about your assets. You will be asked if you received or anyone in your household received any of these federal benefits. If you did not, you'll want to select none of the above. Continue on through the financial section about your tax return. If your parents filed a joint tax return, that will be easy. All of the information will have been downloaded into the FAFSA at one time, but if your parents filed separately, they may each have to log in as a contributor to have their individual tax information downloaded. As I mentioned, you will be asked to identify those members in your family. And if it's different than what you see on your um, tax return, that's fine you can manually update these numbers. There are very few questions this year on uh, the tax return because the majority of it will be downloaded and transferred over. However, you want to make sure you're reading through each of these questions to see if any apply to you. Then it's time for the parent to sign the FAFSA. So you can see here, of course, again, they'll want to download, um, they'll want to click on the down arrow and take a look at all of their questions and answers to those and provide any updates that they, um, they may need to. Then it's time for your contributor to sign, agreeing that the information he's put on this FAFSA is correct to the best of his knowledge. Once both the student and his contributor or contributors has completed their sections of the FAFSA, then it's time to submit. Now, if you're in a situation where you do not live with your legal parents, let's say you live with your grandparents, those grandparents should never enter their information on your FAFSA. Even if you're living with them, you still need information from your legal parents. Now, if those grandparents have legally adopted you, then yes, they're your legal parents. If those grandparents are your legal guardians, then you don't need anyone else's information because you are an independent student. If you have questions about this, Again, please ask. You have plenty of resources and we're here to help you. Once your FAFSA is submitted, the information is going to be processed by federal student aid and sent to the financial aid offices at each of the colleges that you've reported. They will begin to work on your cost of attendance identify any grants and scholarships that they can offer you to go to their college. And they're going to determine what your net price is. And that's what you or your parents, um, if they're willing or um, responsible for paying for your academic year, 24-25. All colleges should provide you with a financial aid offer. It's not gonna be a uniform offer. Uh, this would be nice if everything was in, in the same order. However, they're all going to look a little bit different, but they all should line item your cost of attendance and what those costs are, any grants or scholarships you're offered, 
any loans they may offer you to meet, pay for that net price, any uh, work study that you might be eligible for. So you will be able to take all of these financial aid offers and lay them all out to determine if price is important to you, you'll get a better idea of the college to select. You'll always want to accept financial aid in this order, the scholarships and grants, because this is the free money that does not have to be repaid. You worked for federal work study, you earned that money so you don't have to pay it back, but the loan portion of your offer does have to be repaid. So that's why this year it's very important. This is prime scholarship time. Your counselor should have a list of scholarships. She hears from organizations probably on a daily basis. Check with your parents' employers. They could offer some scholarship opportunities for children, nonprofit organizations like LILA, um, local businesses, churches, social organizations you're aware of. Just continue that scholarship search. I want to give you a, a minute or so to pull out your mobile phones because this is Leela's $1,000 FAFSA Completion Scholarship. If you scan this QR code, you'll be taken directly to the application itself. And this is for high school seniors in the state of Louisiana who plan to complete their FAFSA. And I want to give you just a moment to pull that up. You don't have to apply, but if you keep it in your browser, you can apply when you're ready. Additionally, for those of you who choose to stay in Louisiana to attend college, we offer another scholarship opportunity. It's for those students who are already in school this year or those who will be entering college in Louisiana next year. So make note of this as well. If you need additional funds, if you're going to a pricier college, maybe an out-of-state school, and you are limited to the amount you can borrow through federal student aid, Leela does administer a nonprofit education loan program. So it's called Leela Choice. And if you need a few extra dollars, please feel free to check out of this option at leelachoice.org. Now, every year you, that you're going to be in college, you must complete a FAFSA if you are choosing to receive and accept federal student aid. So make sure you're recording all of your FSA ID information, keeping it in a safe place, I keep mine for my children in my tax return folder. So I've got my 22 tax return completed. I'll pull over my um, instruction sheet with my IDs and it's time to begin the FAFSA for the 24-25 academic year. We will publish our FAFSA completion guide again this year once federal student aid has advised us of all of the changes that were coming this year. So if you have registered for this session or for a Leela scholarship, we will you will be one of the first to receive an electronic copy of this guide. This is my contact information. If you need to speak to me about something having to do with general college financial aid, or you have a FAFSA question or an FSA ID question, please contact me and I'll be willing to, um, I'll be happy to help you with that. At this time, I'm gonna check our chat box again to see what kind of questions we have. And if you do have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer it. Yes, I will be recording and am recording at this minute the uh, this presentation. So you are 
Um, Ms. Craven, you are welcome to do with it whatever you'd like. Send it along to your students or post it on your web page. Okay, this student is disabled and receives social security. She does not file tax returns. What will she need to provide as income? Okay, if you are dis if you are disabled, I'm assuming I don't know if this is a parent or a student, but either way, if you are disabled and you receive social security income, that is not considered a working wage. So you do not have to report any of that. You do not have to have filed a tax return for the period requested. However, you should provide consent to allow federal student aid to get that verification directly from IRS. They'll check their site and say, oh, we have no return filed for that tax year. Other than that, if you had no working income, you will not have to report anything in the income section. You may be asked to provide information about your assets. So make sure you have account balances ready if needed. Okay, I'm not sure if this is the same question um, about signing a waiver. Um, you can, that yes. is an option as far as the Louisiana Department of Education goes. But um, remember that if you do sign a waiver, you will not be eligible for federal student aid. And you don't wanna leave any of that money on the table if you're going to college. Okay, so Ms. Carmichael. Yes. So with um with this student, so I just need to like meet with mom, speak to mom and see exactly with the student what they're um wanting to do for the future, like school or anything like that. And then that would determine if I would do the waiver or the parent would do the FAFSA. Um yes. If the student okay. is not planning to go on to college, you know, that's their choice. They can um, opt out. But if they at any time during that academic year change their mind, it's it never hurts to have that FAFSA available. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And these monies can be used, of course, at technical schools, community colleges um, for certificates. So hopefully they'll participate. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss uh, Diaville, did that answer your question? Does anybody else have questions? As I mentioned, if you don't want to talk about your personal business on a, on a session like this, that's fine. Please contact me directly or um, talk to Ms. Craven. Ms. Craven, is this you on the line? Yes, this is me. I, I saw somewhere that you recently won an award. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What was the that district, about? A uh, district um, counselor of the year for oh high my. school. That is incredible. Well, congratulations. Thank you. You're very welcome. If I can help you in any other way, please feel free to give me a call um, and I'll be there for you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Carmack, Michael, for your time. And thank you, uh, Ms. Kendra, for being on the Zoom. All right, everybody have a good evening. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.